strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the second book of Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself will, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, and water was parted to one side and to the other, and the two of them crossed among dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what I may do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father! the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. Let us read a portion of Psalm 50, printed in your worship program. We will read the psalm responsively by whole verse. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. God is thine, perfect in its beauty. God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the greatness of his cause, for God himself is judge. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, 
and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. to love and Valentine's Day, but I would like to focus on the silent part. There is so much in our world from which I would like to withdraw. I can sympathize with Simon Peter who wanted to build three booths and stay on the mountaintop of the Transfiguration in the presence of Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Unfortunately, he was not given that option and neither are we. We must live in this world of harsh, discordant noise. There seems to be no escape from noise in our society. Wouldn't it be nice, though, from time to time, to experience what Peter, James, and John experienced on the mountain of the Transfiguration? They had gone away to a secluded spot for the prayer with the Master. Doubtless, they were not prepared for what happened then. Every year I looked forward to the annual Deacon's Retreat, the Stella Maris Retreat Center at the Jersey Shore. I looked forward to that retreat because I not only had the opportunity to have fellowship with my fellow deacons, but I also got to spend a lot of quiet time during the weekend as well. It helped me to refocus on what God's plans were and not on what my plans were. Also, in my former life, before becoming a deacon. As a youth advisor, our church would take our youth on retreat to the mountains of Vermont. We spent a week on the mountain and we made the kids take tree time, where they were asked to find a tree in the forest and spend an hour there by themselves, and they were not to be able to see another person in sight. It was a big forest, so there were plenty of trees. 
It forced the youth to spend that quiet time lost in their thoughts and to be close to God. It was one of my favorite times of the day. It is interesting that on two occasions, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to a secluded spot for prayer. It was these same three who not at all thought Jesus prayed in Gethsemane. This time, however, they experienced something that they would never forget. They were not only in the presence of Jesus, but also two of the most significant figures of the Old Testament, Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. I must confess that on my retreats, a lot of my quiet time is spent sleeping, but I think God has our undivided attention now. Doubtless, the three disciples were stunned. Peter spoke up and declared, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Good old Simon Peter, putting in his two cents worth as usual. About this time, a cloud, the symbol of God's presence, moved in and enshrouded them, and they were afraid. A voice spoke from the cloud, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken and the cloud departed, Moses and Elijah had vanished. The author of Mark tells us that Jesus commands them to tell no one about what they have seen until after the Son of Man is risen from the dead. What was there to say? There are some experiences for which words are inadequate. How can words express what you feel when you first hold a newborn child? What words are adequate to comfort one who has lost his or her life's partner? Even more strikingly, what can you say when you have seen, have been in the presence of the living God? Many of us are afraid of silence. We grow uncomfortable as the conversation wanes. But there are occasions that demand silence. What would be some of those occasions? Silence is the best response in the presence of a mystery too great for our understanding. That was the disciples' situation. They were in the presence of a mystery simply beyond their power to comprehend. James and John had sense enough to keep silent. Simon Peter, however, not knowing what to say, blurted out his suggestion that he, they build three dwellings and stay on the mountain. But even he grew silent as the mystery intensified. We may not want to admit it, but there are mysteries that demand silence. The mystery of suffering and death, for example. There are some questions without an answer. When I have, as your deacon, come to visit you in the hospital or at the nursing home or in your home, in which you have experienced a great tragedy, I will sit with you. I will struggle with you to find meaning. I will pray with you. I will try to restrain myself from giving answers of which I am unsure. God's ways are not our ways. Some questions have no answers. Such times demand a measure of silence. We can but wait on the Lord and trust that through, though we see through fuzzy lenses, one day we will see face to face. This is one occasion that silence seemed appropriate. Silence is the best response when we are in the presence of something or someone greater than ourselves. We need that kind of inspiration from time to time to ponder a masterpiece or to sit at the feet of a legend. At times like that, we do not chat alone. We sit quietly, expectantly, reverently, with a longing to soak up as much of the greatness as we are able. When my mom and I went on a pilgrimage to Italy years ago, I was overwhelmed with the various churches and cathedrals we visited. And there were times when I physically could not approach the altars when my fellow pilgrims were gathering personal, getting personal tours of the altars. I felt too much in the presence of God and I felt I had to just stand silently in awe. We also went into the prison where Peter had been imprisoned and where he baptized the guard and his family. There was a pool of water on the floor that had appeared when this happened, 
and was still there to this day. When we walked into that room, no one uttered a word. We all stood like statues, staring at the water, silent in the presence of the mystery. Of course, this is one reason we come to worship, to be present in the mystery. In his autobiography, Albert Schweitzer said that one of the main things his parents did for him as a child was to take him to worship services, even though he was too young to understand much of what was going on. He claimed it is not important that children understand everything. What is important is that they shall feel something of what is serious and solemn. Can you see Peter, James, and John as they contemplated what it meant to be in the presence not only of Jesus but also Elijah and Moses? And then on top of all that, to hear the voice of God as well. No wonder they were silent. Here was dust encountering divinity, the temporal in the presence of the eternal. The imperfect face to face with holiness itself. How do we need such experiences today? Such experiences demand silence. In that silence, however, there is power. Silence is appropriate in the presence of a mystery too great for our understanding. Silence is appropriate in the presence of something or someone greater than we ourselves. One more thing. Silence is the best response if we would hear the voice of God. As a young man, Benjamin Franklin was somewhat arrogant in his opinions and wanted to do most of the talking in his conversations with his friends. He was so quick to tell people that they were wrong that they began crossing to the other side of the street to avoid speaking to him. A Quaker friend kindly informed Franklin of this unpardonable fault and convinced Ben by mentioning several instances in which he had rudely dismissed the opinions of others. Ben Franklin was so stricken by this revelation that over half a century later, when he was 79 years old, he wrote these words in his famous autobiography. Considering that in conversation, knowledge was obtained rather by the use of the ears than of the tongue, I gave silence second place among the virtues I determined to cultivate. That was an excellent step on Franklin's part. Now, for just a moment, try to put yourself in God's place when it comes to prayer. It must be frustrating for God when we come to God in prayer, seeking God's guidance, and then we proceed to do all the talking. Suppose you and a friend who always talked and never listened. Wouldn't you be frustrated? Yet so often we make our requests of God and then move on to other things without giving God a chance to say anything in return. There is a time for silence. There is a time for shutting out all conflicting noises. There is a time to stop talking and to listen. So, as we prepare to enter the season of Lent on Wednesday, and as I say goodbye for now, let us use this season to be silent in prayer and to listen in silence.
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. To the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, and is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are Form 6. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For, for our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friends, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and William, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. And thanksgiving for the Trinity family. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For the ministry of Peter Blessed. We will exalt you, O God our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit that we may live and serve you in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sin through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. A couple of brief announcements today. Um, as Leslie mentioned, it is the beginning of Lent on Wednesday. Um, we will stream one Ash Wednesday service from the church at noon. That service will then be available the rest of the day to watch on our website, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel so that you can celebrate Ash Wednesday in prayer with the church um, beginning at noon and any time thereafter on Wednesday. Please also make sure you uh, look in your mail for the packet you should have received this past week uh, with materials for Ash Wednesday and keeping a holy Lent. Uh, 
the announcements this week include information about joining a couple of different learning opportunities for Lent, so please read those carefully. A word also about today. As you know, this is Leslie's last Sunday as deacon with us as she retires after almost 20 years with Trinity. Uh, because of the ice this morning, we are changing our plans. There will not be a live uh, event at 1030 outdoors. Instead, we will have, we will stream on all of the channels on which you are watching this now, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and website. We will stream a brief farewell and blessing from right here in the church. And we invite you, if you had planned to come at 1030, or if you had not planned to come, but it is safe for you to, to drive between 1 and 2 p.m. today, to come to a drive-up farewell uh, in the Trinity parking lot. That's 1 to 2 p.m. if you registered. You will get an email this morning to uh, tell you those details. If you didn't register, you can still watch the farewell or join us at 1 o'clock, between 1 and 2 o'clock in the Trinity parking lot. So, when we hope there will not be so much ice on the roads. So, all right. But right now, Leslie, will you stand up for a minute? Uh, you know, we have, we, we have some other folks who will speak to you at, at the, the little ceremony uh, later. But I just want to take a moment in worship to acknowledge that since 2003, right, Leslie has served uh, Trinity as our deacon and uh, added assistant to the rector of duties and moved into the office in 2007, right? Right. Uh, she has served faithfully and well through all that time, carrying out all of the responsibilities entrusted to her with great care and attention, giving generously of her heart and spirit and modeling her faith for us. And I know that it is after prayer and listening mm -hmm. and careful consideration that Leslie has heard God calling her to move to what is next after this role, to take some time to rest and to renew herself for what God is calling her to do. So now, you and I, as the people of Trinity, we are called to hear God and to recognize and support this transition in Leslie's life and ministry. We're called to let go of the pastoral relationship, but not of the love, not our friendships, but to let go of that pastoral relationship with grace and thanksgiving, as Leslie is also called to do. Leslie, I ask, do you have anything you'd like to say to the congregation? It's getting harder and harder. <laughs> as I leave Trinity to rest and to follow a new path on my journey of serving God, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you for all your love and support. Know that all will be well. God will sustain us and guide us. I know that God has a new path for you to follow as well. And with Mother Emily as your faithful leader, may God bless you all. So long for now. Whether you are near or far, I want to ask you to join with me now in celebrating Leslie's ministry and sending her forth with our goodwill and our blessings. I'm going to make you stand up just for a minute again. And I'm going to ask every one of you who's participating in this worship service, even though you think we can't see you, to hold out your hands and blessing as we pray. Oh God, you have bound us together for a time as deacon and as people to work for the advancement of your kingdom in this place. We give you thanks for the ministry with which we have shared in these years past. We thank you for your patience with us when we were slow of heart. We thank you for your forgiveness and mercy when we have erred or lost our way. 
We thank you for the grace by which you have multiplied our efforts and for the joy which you have bestowed upon us in our work and life together. We thank you especially for your never-failing presence with us through these years, for drawing us together in your word and sacraments, and for the deeper knowledge of you and of each other which we have attained. Now we pray be with Leslie as she leaves us and with us who stay, and grant that all of us, by drawing ever nearer to you, may always be close to each other in the communion of your saints. May we hear your love. May Leslie hear your, our love for her in her silences, and may we hear her love in ours. All this we ask in the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you today and always, Leslie. Amen. 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 Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
join me in the prayer for spiritual communion printed in your program. Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. And since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. Let us pray together, Almighty and ever-living God. We thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the holy and undivided Trinity, be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. I want everybody at home to stand up. Today is the last day we get to say our hallelujahs till Easter. So I want to hear it through that camera. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Alleluia! Alleluia! Thank you.